Hi, welcome back to the lecture series. My name is Fong Yulu and I'm an F1 in Queen Elizabeth Hospital Woolwich. I worked in acute medicine, geriatrics, and I'm currently on respiratory. So just a reminder, this lecture is part of a series that will be uploaded once a week until August. The first six lectures will be on COVID, the next four on the role of F1 in various shifts, and the last two will be targeted for those uh, who will be taking SJT in December. Today I'll talk about diagnosing COVID. To make it more interesting, I'll use a real COVID case whilst discussing the risk factors, symptoms, differentials, laboratory tests, radiology findings and COVID testing. So let's take a look at the first half of the history and try and identify some risk factors of mortality in COVID. This is a 36-year-old male who was brought in by ambulance to emergency department with fever and cough. He has a background of end-stage renal disease on daily peritoneal dialysis, secondary to hypertensive disease. He is on three classes of antihypertensives and EPO twice a week. He lives with his wife and two young children never smoked and does not drink alcohol. Here is a table that shows the odd ratio of in-hospital death according to the risk factors. If the odd ratio is more than one, it means that the factor is associated with increased risk of death in hospital. So age has an odd ratio of 1.14 and that increases by number of years. Female has an odd ratio of 0.61, so male is a risk factor of in hospital death. Smoking also increases your risk of death, and in terms of comorbidities, it's arranged from highest odd ratio to lowest odd ratio. So, comorbidities that's associated with in hospital death includes coronary heart disease, COPD, hypertension, diabetes dementia, obesity, CKD, and malignancy. So for the man that we looked at, he has an increase of in-hospital death because he's a male with hypertension and chronic kidney disease. So more about him. He complained of four to five days history of dry cough, shortness of breath, and fatigue. He was trying to manage at home, but the shortness of breath worsened, and that's why he presented to the hospital. He reports he did not feel feverish, though uh, temperature was recorded on the London Ambulance Service, and it was 38.6, so he was febrile. Systemic review showed no symptoms of chest pain, dysuria, diarrhea, or headache, and no constitutional symptoms, so that helps exclude other causes of, of his symptoms. On admission, his temperature was 37.8, respiratory rate was 28, which is raised. He was hypoxic with the London Ambulance Service saturating 85% on room air. He's tachycardic and hypertensive. His ECG showed sinus tachycardia. VBG showed very very mild um, metabolic acidosis with a lactate of 0 0.7 which is not raised. ABG on room ed showed type 1 respiratory failure and ABG on 15 litres showed um, improved PO2 and no evidence of retaining um, CO2 so it's still type 1 respiratory failure. So symptoms of COVID uh, commonly includes high temperature, new contiguous cough, anosmia and agusia. So um, he actually has the foremost common symptoms of COVID, which includes cough, fever, shortness of breath and fatigue. Other symptoms that could be associated with COVID includes confusion, diarrhea, vomiting, myalgia, chest pain and headache.
so even though he has the most common symptoms of COVID, it's actually not very specific because it it also has a lot of different uh, differentials. So for him, given that he has cough, fever, shortness of breath, type 1 respiratory failure, sinus tachycardia, at that time his top differential is COVID because he came in at the peak of COVID. But before COVID, he, he the most common differentials would have been common cold, influenza or cap. It's important to exclude PE for him as well because he was in type 1 respiratory failure and was sinus tachycardic. Temperature is less likely in PE but they could also have um, a fever. Further down the line are SARS and MERS which are both not common and he also didn't have a travel history. In terms of his admission blood test, he was anemic um, with normocytic anemia, um, he was lymphopenic, the dimer was raised, potassium and creatinine are raised, um, phosphate was raised and CRP was raised as well. So the anemia and um, creatinine and potassium could be associated with his end-stage renal disease but um, given that his baseline creatinine from two years ago was actually 380 he's likely to have AKI on top of CKD. So in a study that assessed uh, blood tests for all COVID patients and first and also COVID patients that has poor prognosis, it shows that white cell count is not really associated with COVID, but lymphopenia is um, found in a lot of COVID patients as long as as well as CRP, raised CRP, raised LDH, and raised D dimer. And when you look at this table, the column of all COVID patients showed the percentage of presence of the the blood tests in COVID patients, and the column on the right shows the percentage in um, the occurrence of those blood tests in patients that were very poorly, so it had to be admitted to ITU, required mechanical ventilation or death. So for those that has a high percentage in the right-hand column versus the left-hand column are potential prognostic markers. So for example, Procalcitonin of more than 0.5 only occurs in 5.5% of all COVID patients, but 24% of patients that required ITU ventilation or death. So, raised procalcitonin is associated with a poor prognosis in COVID patients, and that's the same case in most of these blood tests. And lymphopenia is also associated with increased risk of death. So here shows uh, uh, six tables that shows a blood test versus the days of admission and these are all COVID patients and it's just a comparison of uh, blood tests in those who survived and those who did not survive. So the non-survivors are the ones uh, in uh, red lines and the survivors are blue. So rising D-dimer, IL-6, ferritin, troponin and LDH are more associated to death and lymphopenia is more associated with 
non-survivors as well. So let's talk about the SOFA score. The SOFA score is like the Apache 2 score and Horowitz index, which are clinical prediction tools that are commonly measured in all patients that are admitted to ITU to determine the level of acuity and mortality risk. This information can be then used in a number of ways such, such as providing the family with a prognosis or for clinical trials or for quality assessment. It does not influence medical management but um, it can help predict the outcome of the patient. So um, the SOFA score look at variables in different organs, so respiratory, cardiovascular, liver, renal, coag, and neurology. Both have a section and was scored from 0 to 4. So on the table on the right, you can see that a higher SOFA score is associated with higher mortality in all patients. There's also a quick SOFA score which only measures the respiratory rate, blood pressure, and GCS, and the higher number of score, the higher mortality rate. So in the context of COVID, um, the, the risk of hospital death is increased by each point in SOFA and quick SOFA score. So each point in quick SOFA score increased the risk by 6.14 and each point in quicksilver score increased risk of 12.0. So for him, the patient, he had a high respiratory rate of 28. He is not hypertensive and he did not have an altered GCS. So he had a quicksilver score of 1 and the odd ratio of in hospital death is 12. In terms of radiology findings, um, the most common imaging that we do is chest X-ray plus or minus CT scan. So in our hospital, CT scan is not that commonly done. It's usually done if the patient is going to ITU or if you're trying to exclude other diagnoses such as PE where you need to do a CTPA. So in chest X-rays, the most common findings are ground glass opacity, local patchy shadowing, bilateral patchy shadowing, and less commonly interstitial abnormalities. So ground glass opacification in chest X-ray refers to a region of hazy lung radio opacity, and it's often fairly diffuse in which the edges of the pulmonary vessels may be difficult to appreciate. So here on the left hand side, the chest x-ray shows ground glass opacity. Um, you can see the increased shadowing of the, both the left and right lower zones and it's the, the vessels are less um, defined than the upper zones. The chest x-ray on the right shows patchy shadowing bilaterally. Um, also, it, it's got some ECG leads on it, got a, a tube on the uh, oxygen tube that's, that's superficial on the left upper zone. And you can see the, the central line on the right here and an NG tube that goes all the way to the out, uh, to the stomach. In terms of CT, the most common finding is also ground glass opacity, local patch shadowing, bilateral patch shadowing, and interstitial abnormalities. Ground glass opacification in CT refers to increased attenuation in the lung 
with preserved bronchial and vascular markings and it's a non-specific signs with wide etiology including infection, chronic interstitial disease and acute alveolar disease. So here shows a CT scan of a COVID patient. You can see that in the right hand side there's a lot of ground glass shadowing here so it's increased attenuation versus the lung more anteriorly it's it's grayer and it's a bit patchy as well on the posterior part of the right lung there's evidence of pleural effusion which is the white out part here and it's a very well defined line between the lung and the opacification so it you can tell that it's an effusion rather than a very thickened pleura on the left hand side of the patient there is ground glass glass opacification but you can see that it's it's a lot more um, see here it's a lot more whiter than the other side so this is consolidation of the lung and actually there's also evidence of effusion on on the left hand side so CT scan is actually very sensitive for COVID, but it's not specific. Um, there are various scorings that they use in CT scan for COVID now, and some of them are um, based on the area, percentage area affected in the lungs. So this patient would have a very high score because basically more than 90% of lung is affected. So in terms of testing, um, the testing that we do for patients is uh, RT-PCR swab test. It's 70% sensitive and 95% specific. But it's very dependent on the site and quality of sampling. So in, a, in one study with 205 patients um, with COVID, the swab test was positive and sensitive for sorry, the, the sensitivity was 93% for bronchial alveolar lavage, 72% for sputum, 63% for nasal swabs, and only 32% for throat swabs. So the accuracy is also likely to vary depending on the stage of disease and degree of viral multiplication or clearance. In one of our patients in the ward at the moment, he had a positive swab on admission and within 24 hours he had a second swab and that was negative and few few days later he had a negative swab again. So it's highly unlikely that the swab has become negative in 24 hours. It's probably due to the technique of the swab. So if you were to take a nose and throat swab, you use one swab and rub the swab against the almost the uvula and tonsils area um, a few times and then to the nose both both sides of the nostrils and then put it back to the um, container it's very important the swab is done properly because it, it does affect the management of the patient and discharge plan. So back to our guy to complete the story. He, this is his chest x-ray on day one. 
So there is evidence of patchy shadowing on both flanks. There's a huge effusion here of the left side. So there's no no um there's no wonder he was so hypoxic in in the beginning. So then next day he had a chest drain put in so here you can see part of the chest drain and you can see that the effusion has reduced in size and there's actually some ground, ground glass uh, opacity here and also patchy shadowing in the rest of the lungs here are some ECG leads day three um, here you can still see the chest drain here and here. This is um, the repeat chest x-ray. Um, it shows res complete resolution of the effusion. But there's a secondary pneumothorax. So sometimes with chest drains, pneumothorax can happen if the chest drain is blocked or when the effusion is drained. So they left the chest drain in and later on in the day the 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 pneumothorax has resolved but you, as you can see here the sh shadowing the patchy shadowing is actually getting worse in both lungs. So finally on day 4, he became more and more unwell despite uh, the management with antibiotics, chest strain and oxygen. You can see that he's, he's like more than half of his lung is wiped out. Um, before he was, before ITU was involved, his latest gas on 15 litres non-rebreathe showed type 1 respiratory failure with PO2 of 7.37. Compared to his previous gases, his CO2 is creeping up and um, the lactase remains n not raised, but he will, his respiratory rate was 50 to 60 per minute and his saturation was 85 to 90% despite being on maximum oxygen therapy. So he's very unwell and there's risk of him tiring out. Um, therefore, he he was um, referred to ITU. He was tube. Here you can see the ETT, the tube, and um, he was brought into the ITU with the chest drain still in situ. After he was brought into the ITU. He was transferred to GSTT um, for vasopressors and continuation of dialysis. He's um, got pneumothorax secondary to chest drain in, uh, insertion and also had a subsequent par pericardial tamponade which was uh, drained. He was extubated 18 days later and he was transferred to King's for hemodialysis as the peritoneal dialysis catheter stopped functioning. Um, he, in between this, he had a uh, upper GI bleed due to a D1 ulcer. Then he was discharged 14 days later. And then he was readmitted three weeks later due to shortness of breath on exertion and he was found to have bilateral PE and started on warfarin. So he had a series of complications for having COVID, um, including pleural effusion, pneumothorax, and PE. Interestingly, 10 weeks from 
him presenting to a and &E the first time with cough and fever and get diagnosed COVID and 10 weeks after he presented again to the a and &E with shortness of breath so that's his chest x-ray it shows a lot of scarring in the lungs but also some um, patchy shadowing and ground glass opacity with evidence of effusion as well um, he was saturating one lit uh, saturating 98% on one liter or two liters so he wasn't too unwell um, he was started on antibiotics for HAP a bedside ultrasound thorax reveals B lines and traces of pleural effusion on the left hand side so B lines are indication of institutional edema um, on, on ultrasound scan and there's moderate size um, effusion on the right hand side with populations as well so, so there are pleural effusion on both sides he was discussed with the renal team um, in King's and then he was transferred to King's for management of HAP alongside with dialysis the, the reason that we had transferred him is because the effusion is likely secondary to the um, end stage renal failure rather than the infection so rather than us managing him with antibiotics and his usual peritoneal dialysis transfer to King's renal is more sensible to up titrate the dialysis to offload him so that's the end of the presentation I hope you enjoyed it here are a list of references. Hope to see you in the next lecture. The next lecture will actually be done by one of my colleagues. So please tune in and it will be very interesting. Thank you. See you. Bye.